In this video, you will find me driving a Toyota, which I'm not usually happy about. This is a uh, little Yaris, very embarrassing. But it is uh, just as deserving as any other car of a uh, dash cam installation. And uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. This is a bit of a hand-me-down. I'm putting my uh, old Viofo A129 into this car. Um, that's a front and a rear camera. Uh, and it also has a uh, parking mode which we're going to wire up so it's going to be a hard wire install and um, the other thing, only other thing I'll say before we get on is uh, this isn't going to be a review of that particular camera I've already done a review of this uh, A129 Duo uh, so if you're interested in the specifics of the camera then uh, you can go and watch that separately this will basically be a video that just covers the uh, specific things you need to look at when you're installing any dash camera into the uh, um, second generation Toyota Yaris. So this camera system uses a modified USB power source, uh, but it has this install kit which abstracts that away. And like most dash cams, we only need to worry about connecting up two or three cables. Uh, this box is also a low voltage cutoff switch for battery saving purposes. And because this camera has a distinct parking mode, uh, there are two positive connections that need wiring up, one permanent live and the other to be plugged into the car's ACC or ignition switch circuit. Now, I'm using those fuse taps you see in the background. More on that later. The interior fuse box on the Yaris is on the left side of the car in the footwell. Uh, you can access the main fuse panel without removing any of the dashboard. There's just this flap cover that pulls off on this right-hand drive car, it's uh, below the glove box, which I took out so that I could see the uh, extra bits and pieces that are placed sort of awkwardly above the main fuses. You can see there are a bunch of uh, plug connectors, uh, relays, and uh, one or two extra fuses here. Normally, I would be looking to use the fuse taps to get the power for any accessory, uh, but this was the uh, first challenge with this car. The plastic cover sort of precludes the use of them because they stick out too much. Uh, so I was already starting to think about alternatives. And the other thing is, uh, even if you figure, well, you know, just leave the cover off, what does it really matter? Uh, this fuse box is located in a slightly vulnerable position because it's exactly where the occupant's foot has a tendency to rest. So uh, you can imagine that any exposed wires sticking out here are not exactly going to be very well protected. So I gave up on the main panel, I put the cover back, and uh, having noticed this 7.5 amp fuse on the upper section here, I figured it was worth just checking to see if it could be used. And when I tested uh, whether it was live or not uh, with the key off, uh, I wasn't getting any voltage. So that was actually promising because it's the uh, hardest to find the ACC circuit if you uh, can't use the radio fuse socket or something similar. So on turning the key to the accessory position, which is uh, when we want the dash cam to go into its normal driving mode, I tested that fuse again, and sure enough, I had power. And when you check this, by the way, you need to identify which side of the fuse socket is the hot side, uh, up or down, or you know, left or right, depending on the orientation, because it matters for the uh, orientation of the fuse tap. Now in my case it was the low side, but uh, don't just copy me in case it's different. Anyway, this one little fuse saved me from having to do any wiretaps or any other sort of headache. I still had one more challenge though, which was finding a convenient source for permanent power, and uh, I was uh, truly out of fuses this time. Uh, by the way, uh, to track a permanent power outlet, you do need to turn off the key and take it out. And not only that, but lock the car. Uh, so that the car knows to turn all of its systems off, uh, then that might even take a little while on modern cars. Uh, you need to give it up to an hour, uh, depending on um, the car in particular, for any power saver relays to kick in. If you go measuring power immediately, you might find something that just gets turned off by the car a little bit later, uh, which will uh, then you know give you grief, of course, later on. Um, as to the power, I was uh, thinking uh, I might have to wiretap a cable or something, but I realized uh, there was this empty socket above the ACC fuse that I'd found with four connections. Uh, I'm not sure what it's intended for, but um, it is wired up, uh, but it's not being used. There's nothing plugged into it on this car. And I stuck the probe into them, and uh, lo and behold, the middle one gave me live voltage. So again, you do need to lock the car up and uh, let it time itself out and then come back and check. 
But uh, I can tell you that this little cheat uh, is giving me permanent power, so I figured I'd just use that. How, you might ask? Uh, well, onto the fuse taps. And this is a fuse tap for a mini fuse, which is not actually what the Yaris uses. But you'll notice uh, these deep, uh, nice deep and thick blades. And it occurred to me that they uh, might make the ideal plug. And what do you know, the one blade inserts almost perfectly into that socket connection. Uh, this tap has the one fuse in the uh, addition position, which is what's needed. So um, I was installing the fuse along with this uh, little trick solution. Now, if you do something like this, it's important that you use the upside blade of the tap, not the downside, which is the one that has the wire tail, uh, because otherwise the fuse uh, won't actually be in line in the new circuit. You can see there the wire is uh, getting the same power that I already measured before. And lastly, before I put it in, I cut a bit of heat shrink to use as insulation on the other unused blade that was uh, just going to be sticking out in space, just to eliminate any possibility of a short circuit. It's not really necessary because uh, if the other fuse uh, for the original circuit is not present, uh, you know, which as you can see it isn't, then that blade's actually not connected to anything. Uh, but I just thought it was a good idea just in case. And back to the uh, ACC circuit, the first one I looked at, that requires a tap compatible with the Yaris's fuses, which are low profile mini fuses, uh, which is what this is. At this time, of course, both of the fuses need to be present. The upper one is the new addition for the dash cam, and the lower one is the original, uh, although in my case, uh, they were both 7.5 amps, so it actually made no difference. Then it was time for some wiring work, uh, connecting up those fuse taps to the dash cam power supply. Uh, this Viofo hardware comes with pre-cut wires ready for crimping or soldering. Uh, fuse taps usually come with crimp connectors, which I prefer anyway. Uh, no need for a soldering iron or mess. And the only thing, of course, uh, if your connectors are different like this, then make sure you connect them the right way around. Uh, these wires are labeled, but it's always red for permanent power and yellow for ACC. And the black ground cable comes with a ring connector already attached. With that wiring all crimped up with the correct connectors, it could go in the car. Uh, this is the permanent power hack, and as dodgy as this looks, it's really fine. The fuse blade does insert quite firmly in the socket, so there's obviously a good connection, and there's no risk of a short. And remember again that the right blade, uh, that's the one for the hot side, is the one to use if you do something like this then the uh, fuse tap for the actual fuse below for the ACC circuit. Just the same, it's important that the tap goes the right way around. The hot side here was at the bottom, so the tail of the tap goes upward. That means that both the original fuse and the new circuit with its fuse are correctly wired up in parallel to each other. Uh, you'll still get power if it's wrong, uh, which is why you need to be careful. Uh, but you know, if, if, if they're wrong, then the fuses will not be right, so you need to check it carefully. The last connector is the ground wire, which uh, has the open ring terminal. So ideally you need a bolt head that's in electrical contact with the car's chassis. There are usually a few around the internals of a dashboard. Uh, this one here was convenient, although it needed a decent length extension on the uh, socket to reach it. No need to undo it all the way, just a few turns uh, opens up enough space to insert the terminal and then tighten it back up. And with that, there should be power. So uh, I just paused and uh, plugged in the camera at the other end of the power supply and turned on the ignition. Uh, on turning off the ignition on this camera, that will trigger the parking mode and then back on, we'll put it back into driving mode. So it would be best to uh, check all of that too before you go too far with the rest of the cabling. So with everything working, I uh, started to finalize the power supply installation. Firstly, by using a cable tie here just to uh, hold that tap firmly in place. You can see it moves around a little bit where with the tie in place, there is no way that it can come out. Next, the cable needs to be run up the windscreen to the camera itself. And the first step is the A-pillar here. Now on most cars, I would do like five different shots of this from three different angles, you know, to depict all of the different clips that you'd have to worry about. But this being a Toyota, it almost literally just falls off when you look at it. Uh, just a little bit of a lever at the top like this, and it just pulls away. And that's uh, all the access you need. I was able to just poke the cable up through the hole in the dash and uh, pull it up through. I recovered enough cable to make sure it would actually reach the camera. 
uh, but you'd want to leave the excess inside the dash where it's easier to store. And uh, to get along the windscreen top here, uh, I like to hide the cable completely and the uh, headliner usually pulls away from the glass easily enough with a plastic lever, at least enough to push a cable into. At the corner, it needs to be inserted enough to clear everything at the edge and uh, run into the empty space that will be enclosed by the A-pillar cover. And then the cable wants to be run down the A-pillar itself in uh, any way that makes sense. I, I will say that this car does not have an airbag here, so it's very simple. Uh, but if there was one, uh, you must make sure that you route it behind the airbag so that it cannot interfere with it if and when it deploys. The next thing is to mount the front camera. It wants to go up at the top of the windscreen, obviously, uh, but exactly where is up to you. I usually like to put it on the passenger side of the rear vision mirror uh, because there's usually a little better space for it there and it's less distracting to the driver. Um, but this car has windscreen wipers that are biased to the driver's side, as you can see, uh, meaning there's more swept clean glass over here. And you want to make sure the camera has a view through that area. And uh, because it's such a boxy little thing, the Yaris actually has quite a tall windscreen. So I concluded that the uh, driver's side here was uh, best. Now, this camera attaches to the glass with double-sided tape. So it's just a uh, case of cleaning the glass with uh, alcohol and uh, sticking it on. You want to make sure it's as level uh, as you can get it, of course. And uh, regardless of which side you're putting it, you uh, want to still be as central as possible while keeping it clear of the mirror so that that mirror can be adjusted without any interference. Once it's mounted, the cable can uh, be pushed up inside the headliner so that it's uh, just poking out as much as it needs to. And that's that. Back to the fuse box. Uh, now that the uh, camera's in place, I knew how much cable it required up there, obviously, so the excess could be pulled back inside the dashboard and the power supply needs, needed to be uh, securely tidied away. I just uh, used some double-sided tape to stick it on a frame to the side. Uh, this space here on the uh, right on this right-hand drive car is the glove box area, remember? So it needs to be out of the way of that. Uh, then I just cable tied all of the excess wires in convenient places, all coiled up and uh, placed neatly out of the way. Uh, so the uh, final thing was, um, you know, just to make it neat and tidy, and it uh, won't move around or misbehave over time. With the glove box back in, that was all for the fuse box area. And the, the cover back on the A-pillar, which is as easy as removing it was, because Toyota. Uh, just make sure that the seals around its outside edge are properly overlapping. Uh, and uh, obviously that the cable remains properly inside and uh, doesn't get you know jammed up with the various bits and pieces. The next was the rear camera, which is a case of uh, simply mounting the camera on the rear windscreen. Uh, but more inconveniently, running its data cable uh, to the front main camera. You can see here I've unbolted the high brake light, uh, which is just two bolts and it falls away. Uh, there's no surrounding trim because Toyota. And uh, because this Yaris is the hatchback model, it's necessary to get the wire through the cable boots that bridges the hatch to the car body. If you have the sedan, you don't have this problem, uh, but it's not too much of a challenge anyway. I just unplugged the boot at the hatch side like so. Uh, remember, there's a factory wiring in here for important things, so be gentle. And then obviously you need to get access at the bottom inside, uh, which means pulling down the headliner. And to do that, I needed to pull off the rear C-pillar cover, which was just as simple as the A-pillar was because Toyota, and then the headliner will flex down enough. To get the cable through there, I use some uh, aluminium wire rod. It's flexible and uh, soft enough to manipulate like this, but it's uh, stiff enough to push through even a fairly long hole. So I wrapped it around the rear end of the cable and also wrapped tape around the, that joint. The tape's not to hold it because uh, the wire will do that fine, but uh, rather to smooth out the shape so that it will pass through the boot amongst the factory wiring without hooking up on anything. And then I just uh, poke the wire up and through the boot, uh, the rubber boot, uh, bending it to follow the shape as I went. And uh, when the cable joint is ready to go through, I smeared it with uh, silicone grease for lubrication purposes. Uh, this is safe for the rubber and wiring. You don't use anything petroleum based. Uh, and then with a bit of careful pulling and tugging, it came in the end. 
Then the aluminium wire was uh, useful again in getting through the interior of the hatch frame. I wanted the uh, cable to come through at the hole where the brake light wire goes. The idea is the cable will just poke out the side of the plastic enclosure of the light um, and be held in place by the same. So with that in mind, I cleaned the glass again in the area where the camera was going to go and plugged in the camera and uh, then held it in the right location so as to locate the cable uh, while putting the uh, light back in place. You wouldn't actually need to stick the camera on at this point. The idea is just to locate the cable, but you could. And once it was right, I uh, bolted the light enclosure back on. Uh, be careful not to over tighten these bolts as they don't seem to have much in the way of threads to uh, bite into. And um, then these little cover, these little plastic covers just uh, push back into place. So with the cable basically sorted in the hatch, I plugged the rubber boot back in. A little uh, silicone grease helps seal it up properly again. I'll come back to the rear camera itself in a minute, but first to see what it's seeing, it needs to be kept connected up. So I'll finish the uh, routing first. The idea is uh, that it will um, route along the top side of the headliner, which means pulling the headliner and trim away all along that edge. Now the cable will uh, sit just inside the lip of the headliner where there's enough space for it. Uh, and you definitely want a um, plastic trim lever tool like the one I'm using here. That's really the only tool that you need for this job. And as you work forward, you will come to the B pillar. And the easiest way past this uh, was to, again, pull off the uh, pillar cover trim a little bit at the top and then um, poke the cable down and through and then back up to the front side of the headliner. And then I continued um, all the way along the headliner edge until I ended up at the top of the A pillar once again, uh, which you can see I've actually taken off the cover again. So now the cable will uh, go along the windscreen parallel to the main power cable that I did earlier. And that's just a uh, repeat of the same. And uh, I ended up with a little excess cable like this, uh, which is um, which is fine. Now you might uh, not need to do this, but because I wanted the cable to run out at right angles to the front edge of the headliner here, um, I needed it to do a bit of a loop and I couldn't push it from the outside. So uh, what I did, um, I decided to take out the courtesy light to get at it from behind. Uh, you don't need to take out the lenses like I have here, the clips are at the rear. Um, you need to find them and push them forwards until you can pull down the rear edge of the whole assembly. And just let that hang and uh, you'll have access to the void above. That, so what I did is I used my right wire rod again to just poke through and hook the cable. And not its end, but just a section of it, uh, which I just pulled back into that area so that the end was left um, poking out straight and everything looked neat and tidy. So on this camera, the, uh, the rear cable needs to plug into the side of it like this. Um, and then you want to turn it on and check that it's working as expected. Now there's the rear picture there. It's seeing blue sky because the boot hatch is open. Um, and then uh, the light went back in and um, the only remaining thing to do was to uh, deal with the excess cable uh, back at the rear of the car. And um, there's a bit of space inside the, uh, the C pillar trim. So I just coiled it up here cable tied it so it wouldn't unwind and then uh, tucked it safely out of the way. Uh, the rear seat belt is near this spot so you, you would want to be careful it can't interfere with that but otherwise it's a uh, convenient arrangement. And When you put this uh, pillar trim back on along with the headliner you want to ensure that the weather seal properly grips its edge because uh, it's part of what holds that in place. Now just back on the topic of the rear camera, now that it's wired up and working, you can use it to check it's aimed how you want uh, as you mount it. Now, Like the front, the windscreen wiper is biased to the driver's side of the car, meaning that's where it wants to go, so you can clean the glass the, uh, the camera's looking through when you need to. Now, you also want to avoid mounting it on top of one of the demister wires, uh, because they're delicate and easy to damage. And also, it's not ideal to have the lens looking through one of those wires. Finally, you want the camera up as high as possible uh, so as to stay out of the uh, way of the camera's, uh, the driver's rear vision, um, and also to get the best view of the road. Okay, and uh, that's uh, pretty much all. Now there is a front camera, a rear camera. Uh, they both have the parking functionality set up and working, and uh, that's about it. Hope that was helpful. 
Have fun. <laughs>